to uh, make sure that we have uh, enough different interesting things and to make this talk worthy of Tim's intro. Um, I've actually prepared a relatively uh, thick set of comments about both data and entrepreneurship. Um, I started thinking about data intensely uh, from my very first conversation with Tim where we talked about the internet as an open platform and uh, data as one of the things that makes this platform different than other platforms in terms of the fact that you know you normally think okay is that a set of code built upon an operating system or something like that that's actually this platform the data is the platform and it was that uh, various food camps if you ever had the fortune to get invited to a friends of O'Reilly camp I recommended to you and LinkedIn and investments that made me think about the theme uh, that I'm talking about today, which is, you know, how are we, what are we stumbling towards in terms of Web 3.0 and activities are the key to that. <clears throat> Together as entrepreneurs and technologists, we are inventing and creating the future. And we're discovering a new world, and we're doing it faster than most people think. If you look back to the 50s and the 70s, and you looked at what kinds of predictions they made about the future. Those predictions would be things like flying cars, uh, robots, uh, computers that would advance the boundaries of physics and would essentially be, you know, we'd be living in a world of the Jetsons. And of course, none of that, you know, has come true. Uh, you know, I flew here on an airplane, uh, courtesy of the Wright brothers, and customer service courtesy Darth Vader. <laughs> and, and I'm sure most of you did as well. And yet all of these you know, magical predictions didn't turn out to be true, but it wasn't that the future wasn't magical. It's that the general rule that I think about when I think about the future is it is sooner and stranger than we think. And instead of flying cars, right, instead of you know robots, I mean, no robot made me coffee this morning, I had to make it myself, unless you count me as the robot. Uh, being um, two hours earlier than our time zone here. Uh, it, that didn't happen, but instead we entered into an information age where the uh, ability to do things, everything ranging from, you know, like looking at genetics as code, uh, the internet and World Wide Web, the World Wide Web, uh, all of these things became, you know, kind of key to kind of how we're accelerating in the future. So remember what Web 1.0. Web 1.0 was this low, really low bandwidth environment. I don't know how many of you are going to look at me strangely when I say this, but I remember being excited by getting a 2400 baud modem. <laughs> and there's probably, the people who were in the copy probably don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and so, um, uh, you know, Web 1.0 was this environment by which we would go out and we'd search for files. HTML files, right, it's file format. A PDFs, Flash, we'd bring them back. There was this, uh, you know, kind of notion of going into cyberspace. And it was kind of this alternative, strange reality. You didn't actually go there as Reed Hoffman with my relationships around me. You went there as, you know, anime thing, or lost in Austin. <laughs> and you, you know, you might be, uh, you were kind of vaguely worried that maybe some thief would steal your credit card number. And if you were chatting someone up, you were worried that they were a balding old man. <laughs> and that was kind of what Web One, Web One O was. Web Two O, the the central part of the revolution, which you know Tim has also written a lot about, is where we come, to, where the web and real life uh, essentially become much more integrated where our presence online is our real name, our real relationships. And the apps that are, the applications that are built on top of this are things that help us navigate our real relationships, the relationships we already have, the world that we're already navigating. And so it becomes something that is much more uh, deeply embedded in terms of what we're doing. And so uh, the way that kind of conceptualize the range of of Web 2.0 apps are that everything from, of course, social networks, which tend to be, you know, very, uh, you know, central to this whole thing, but also blogging, right? Most blogs are by their real names, uh, and all of that kind.
kind of production, and now of course we have a bunch of things happening with mobile, all that production of identity and presence and relationship information that help us navigate, you know, what restaurants to go to, which movies to see, what to buy, those sorts of things. And the impact has been dramatic. Uh, most recently, you know, we have everything from the revelation of truth in WikiLeaks to revolution in the Middle East, uh, which is, you know, which is key from the viewpoint of uh, power of people and a coordination of people being able to express their voices. And so that's part of the reason why you know, the Web 2.0 thing is not just a, a name, it's an important trend. And we're having a tribal and global conversation in Web 2.0, which is one of the reasons why you know, other countries uh, that also have you know, populations of fun that look at what's going on in Egypt and Libya and are you know, paying attention to it. So this leads us to the natural question. What is Web 3.0? Right? Why should we care about it? Right? And how do we navigate it? And I think people have given all kinds of definitions to Web3. I, I, I'm not really trying to give a semantic talk. The categorization isn't interesting. What is interesting is where should we put our entrepreneurial energy to invent the future? So let me go through a bunch of the prospects that people have said about Web3. Not because, you know, again, semantics not interesting. <laughs> but because the, uh, the what should we invent and where should we be going, and where is all this technological change leading us, is important to both be thoughtful about and also how we create the future. So the kinds of definitions I've heard about Web3 are, it's about bandwidth, it's about the application of the web, it's about video, especially with bandwidth, right? it's location, it's real time, right? it's mobile, uh, let's see, I think there's probably some more. Right? Uh, and of all those, I would say mobile is probably the most relevant because, you know, if you haven't seen iPhones and Androids everywhere, I don't know, what, you know which part of the, the, the developed world you're living in. Obviously, it's still spreading. But that's kind of boring and uninteresting, right? It's clear that the real time with us uh, and how our identities and relationships can express that is going to be very important. The reason I go to data is because this is the progression I see between Web 1, Web 2, and Web 3. And what I think is going to be really interesting in terms of the kinds of applications we can build, the kind of future we can build. Web 1, you know, go search, get data, weird interactivity. Web 2, our real identities, our real relationships. As our real identities and real relationships, we are generating a massive amount of data. We are blogging, we are tweeting, we are status updating, we are uploading photos. It's not just explicit data, we're also uh, essentially implementing, you know, doing implicit data. In fact, we turn on a phone, right, with a GPS location. And then there's the analytic data that goes on top of that, uh, which is when we munge that data, with just algorithms or with other data sources and else, and generate analytic categories of data. And my belief is that Web3 is going to be, if, if there is a, 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 an important thing to look forward to what we can invent, it's what are we inventing out of that data. And the reason why Web3 is new and unique is because we didn't have all of this massive data that all of us are generating, right? Even here, I, actually especially, I can hear the little the, 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 uh, keyboard clicks <laughs> here in this audience right now. Um, and so that's why I think you know, Web3 is an interesting thing to look at. However, there's some potential challenges that we should go through first as a way of getting here. One of the very prominent concerns uh, for thinking about this topic has been privacy. And I think the, you know, the, the thing that, when any time there's new changes in media, uh, people experience the newness not just as something that they're, they're, they're kind of delightfully rushing towards the future in, but also nervousness, anxiety, what happens? And so now there's this ton of data about uh, everybody that is massively available online and a lot of different sources, and a lot of different data, a lot of different uh, uh, mungeable sorts. And what does all that mean? And you know, there's a lot of discussion about, uh, you know, kind of what do corporations do that? You know, what do individuals do with that? You know, what should the standards be? And actually of all of that discussion, 
The discussion that, that makes me most nervous is what a government's doing. And it's because there's kind of two issues when it comes to governments and data. Uh, one of them is if the government, uh, the government is itself the source of most kind of uh, pure power, you know, the, the ability to put people in jail, you know, military, etc. Uh, well, one of them is the government is if they're not being uh, responsible, you have a serious problem in terms of how they're going to use the data. So, you know, the most recent example again with the Middle East is you know how the Libyan government, right? And you can imagine them rating whatever source of friend list you have. It's obviously not just Facebook. It could be IM lists, right? you know, email depositories. There's all kinds of sources of this relationship data and friends list out there to deduce who the friends are and the people that they're fighting. And you know, that's you know, one potential uh, source of deep concern. But another one is governments basically look out uh, for their own citizens, right? So uh, you know, if, you're, if you're in the US and a US citizen, then you know, there's various you know, protections that we have that are pretty good about how we deal with our government in terms of how that deals with us and how it deals with our data. But if you're not a US citizen, <laughs> right, that's a little bit more challenging. Um, and so, you know, you can imagine, uh, matter of fact, I would guess that some of the customs agencies are already trying to look at who are, uh, you know, who are the, uh, you know, like for example, who are the associates of people who are applying for visas, <laughs> right? And that could be a little dangerous and a little scary. This is kind of the Orwellian uh, dystopian. This is the uh, dystopian of saying, uh, basically, okay, the government is gonna control us through information and through power. But this is not the one that I'm most worried about. Uh, the actual one I most worry about is all this Huxley's Brave New World, where what happens is because we're generating all this information, uh, and you know, this, is, this point is largely on the explicit information, but I think it also comes from all the data exhaust and the implicit information as well. So as we're generating all this information, how do you discern truth from, you know, uh, falseness. How do you discern a good perspective from a lie? How do you, how do you, how do you bridge to a new perspective? And with a mass amount of data, we have this danger of, of, of kind of the, you know, Huxley's brave new world, where we're reduced to just holding on to our own opinions and kind of having this massive overload where we're no longer making as, as many decisions as we want. And that's, I think, a key thing to, to navigate. However, as an entrepreneur, right, I'm always an optimist, right? While I think these are good things to stay, in to, to, to stay attuned to and invent the future, to steer around and get to the benefits, and I believe absolutely that we can, you pay attention to these as a way that you navigate. And so, I think one of the things to think about when you get to, oops, Interesting. <laughs> uh, missed one of my points, but that's one of the things when you're actually really trying to connect with the audience. Um, <clears throat> let me get to the, some of the things that I think is, because I, I think these are important to come back to. When I think about how do we construct this future, I think that the, the key thing is to think about what are we doing with this data. And part of it, as you'll see, I kind of have two parts to, to try to give, you know, uh, uh, you know, I try to do as compact chunks as possible in terms of how to think about things. One is about data, and the other one later we'll get to is about entrepreneurship. And in terms of data, there's at least two really important rules that we all need to think about when we're constructing these services. The first rule is never ambush your users. Your users, if they have trust with you and they're building trust by coming to it, come to your site, they leverage it, they use it, right? And you have to make sure that what you're doing, what you ask them to do, and what happens with the data never puts them in a position right, where they feel ambushed, where something bad has happened. And you probably can't prevent it absolutely 100% of the time, just as the same way you can't prevent a car accident from happening when you're driving to the airport, because you're not the only person in control. But you can say that the absolute thing is, in terms of preserving trust data, is never ambush your users. The second is that not all data is created equal. A lot of these discussions about data, privacy, truth, etc., presumes that it's like, well, it's data about the user. <laughs> well, some data 
is actually pretty important, and some data is not that important. So the data that you know, I'm male, 43, you know, uh, live in Silicon Valley, et cetera, that's actually not, in a, you know, other than the government worries that I mentioned before, that's actually not all that concerning. However, data that is essentially equivalent to a password, is, and there's a bunch of different, people say, well, yeah, passwords, of course, you know, those are the credentials by which you come to the system, but actually, there's a number of passwords we have in our lives, and we don't quite think about that, but your credit card number, is actually part of your password to your payments account. <laughs> uh, the fact that what dollar mortgage you pay on your house or what rent you pay is something that's sometimes invented as, a, as an identification, identifier for a password. So how you deal with this kind of information is actually really critical. So these kinds of things, when you're building these data systems, are really key in order to make sure that you steer through the kind of dystopia possibilities or the ambushing possibilities and in, ter in terms of, and then build towards what can be really good. So let's go through um, how the future can be a genuine rather than an ironic brave new world. And let's do it by uh, a few examples. I'm gonna start with LinkedIn, because it's a service I'm you know, modestly familiar with. <laughs> I hope people in the audience are too. Uh, and I don't know how many people have, have played with this. We launched this a couple months ago. But we launched a product called LinkedIn Skills. <laughs> and uh, the reason I'm using this as an example is to show what these patterns are that lead to the construction of these kind of new, uh, uh, new services, new abilities, new ways of navigating the world. And so what we did is we said, all right, let's take the 90 million people we have on LinkedIn. Let's comb through all of the profiles. Let's identify terms that are already in quasi, you know, tag spaces, because there's specialties and other kinds of things. Let's use all that semantics to create a topology of entities, uh, clean those entities in terms of making sure that the entities uh, essentially, you know, like we have a, co a coherent topology, an ontology. <clears throat> and then also using, you know, first just starting with LinkedIn in terms of who a person's connected to, what industries are, what companies they work in, and so forth. Let's create a skills graph, right? One of the things I think about that we will hear more and more of when we think of data is central to what we're doing is you'll hear things like graph and normalization and these sorts of things. And the graph then says, well, what skills are you know, related to each other? Well, once you begin to have this, you say, okay, we have this from LinkedIn, but to really make it good, let's mash it up with Wikipedia. Well, let's go to where a bunch of human editors have gone and said, well, this is an important skill, and here's a description of it. And by the way, in that description, here's this relation to other skills, which can complement the skills graph. And let's make this into a much richer and uh, robust topology of what human skills actually are. Well, once you have this, you can just begin to do all kinds of things in terms of helping people navigate the world. You can help them, for example, an obvious one is job search, like, okay, which skills do I need for this job, or if I have this skill, which jobs am I looking for? But you can also say, okay, which companies are, you know, kind of have these skills in depth, which regions, uh, are the skills trending in popularity or unpopularity? If I have this skill, what are related skills that I need to get? If I put this skill in my profile, maybe some other skills I should consider, or maybe some other skills I should learn. <laughs> All of these things help us navigate uh, our professional worlds, which, like the rest of the world, is actually changing and accelerating pace. And so the ability to bring that app to you from the aggregation and multiple data sources that are essentially denormalized and matched up is an example of what I think a Web3 product can be. <laughs> Let me go to another example. Because we're speaking about navigation, there's an Israeli company called Waze. And normally, you would think the kind of data that Waze asks you for would be something that you would be actually relatively uh, fearful of giving, which is your location and velocity. So what happens is you you know you have the app on and you're driving and it starts sending you know your location and velocity and part of where you could see this is part of the data world where you could be ambushed is well okay you get automated speeding tickets right you go above the speed limit you know you just identify who you are and what speed you're going right it could be a very bad thing and that would be terrible both for the individual and for the company but as long as you don't do that you don't ambush the users you end up with uh, essentially, a, a much better way of solving a problem of, okay, where is the traffic, where is the connection, where is an accident? And a real-time network responding to that 
It literally is, okay, get off the highway now, go surface streets for three exits, get back on the highway, keep going. And saving that kind of time on a daily basis is absolutely going to be absolutely essential. That's another example. And it's part of where I think, you know, the interesting thing to think about is when you think about the uh, explicit, implicit, and analyzed data, it's not just what we tweak, it's all different sorts. And so, for example, the sensor for how much the, the phone is moving is part of what can generate an interesting data stream that can build a killer application. And again, you have to do it in the right way, but part of the part of what's key, I think, in thinking about data is which data is fully open and which data is closed. And part of the reason you do close is not just because you say, okay, well, it may be the right business model for the company. Sometimes, of course, that's right, because companies need to persist. But it's also sometimes how do you protect the user, right? Because a real-time graph of where I am and what speed I'm moving at is not something I want a lot of people to know. Well, right now, I'm moving very fast. <laughs> Google, I think, just announced a, uh, a product at South by Southwest, uh, Ruderon, which is a similar mashup of multiple data sources, including uh, Android and government data and everything else. It's another product in this category. So let's take another example. And part of what I'm doing in these examples is, is kind of gesturing in different directions in terms of how we're navigating the world. Mint.com. Basically, what you do is you upload your financial data, you give it your financial credentials. Again, be always careful about passwords. And it sucks in all your financial information, something you would not want published. Most people would want published, there's occasional variants to that. And based off all that, it creates, an, again, the pattern is aggregation, <laughs> and where that aggregation essentially gives you a, a even just the, the, the signpost, even just the map, of where do I spend a lot and where do I spend a little? <laughs> Even just that map helps me because it goes, oh, I'm spending a lot more than a lot of other people in this kind of expense. Maybe this is something I can look at. And so, but you know, then of course they add in other things like offers that go, oh, a lot of people spend too much of this. Let's see if we can get the cheaper coupons, you know, these sorts of things. And it's another example of putting this kind of aggregate data together that comes out of what, how all we are actually living and makes that into a new way of navigating. As a final example, let's look at Redfin. Redfin is kind of a Charles Schwab of real estate. And what it does is it takes all the data from multiple fields and it, can, it gets it to where, uh, where essentially it's like, okay, what is, what is, what's the value? What's the real-time pricing? What are all these things in terms of how to navigate this? And so by, again, you know, kind of putting this together, your real estate is one of your key assets as in, in terms of, if you actually look at most people's assets and wealth, and part of what was disastrous with the crash is real estate. So navigating that purchase, navigating, understanding the value of the house you're living in, of the house that you may purchase, those things are critical to how we live. So how do we create Web 3.0? So here I'm gonna move to talking about entrepreneurship a little bit. So I've talked about why it is, I think, Web 1, Web 2, Web 3. And I think that entrepreneurship is, uh, you know, an invention is one of the key things that gets us there. And so I'm gonna go through uh, 10 rules of entrepreneurship. Uh, I may, I, re I retain the, uh, I reserve the right to change these later because, I, so, you know, there's this formation of 10, there may be some better way of going, Chris, but I think this is pretty good. First is disruptive change, which is, when you're, ask, when you're starting a venture, ask yourself, is this massive and different? And people frequently go, oh yeah, mine has this new widget. No, it's gotta be 10X different. It's gotta be something that, that changes an industry. One of the ways to think about and to define what is something that's disruptive is if it takes $10 of revenue and replaces it with $1 revenue. And the reason why this is important when you're building something is because it creates an entirely new platform layer. You, know, you can think about these things as kind of sedimentary stacks of, of, of kind of operating system where each layer enables, if you can get cheap enough, enables a new ecosystem on top of it and creates the deeper value chain. So Skype is obviously a uh, disruptive company because Skype, you know, basically, <laughs> yes, I agree, <laughs> uh, basically removes, uh, and this is part of the reason why, of course, it took off in Europe, is it removes these very expensive cross-border uh, phone charges uh, and makes, that, makes you able to build entire kind of new kinds of businesses and operational practices on top of it. 
The second rule of entrepreneurship is to aim big, right? It's the same amount of work to do a small company that you're gonna flip with a great company. Well, the number of years, usually with a small company, you end faster, right? But the effort per year, the, the sweat, the blood, the tears, is the same. And so, aim big, because one of the advantages, if you actually do have a big idea, then you have multiple ways of kind of navigating it. And, you know, part of aiming big is to say, you know, is it gonna affect an entire industry? So I, I'm on the board of this company called Shopkick, and it's trying to revolutionize retail shopping, right? It's not some retail shopping, it's all retail shopping. And that's kind of key to think about when you have an idea that you think might do something. The third rule is to build a network to amplify your company. Because one of the key things to think about, and that's, I don't just think of networks because of LinkedIn, but the thing about networks is, we have a network of people around us, and that's what enables us, whether it's individual professionals or businesses. And those networks are the thing that allows us to have, essentially have a distributed intelligence store and have an ability to, you know, both sensors and actions in order to change the world. And those networks are important the whole way down. They're important at the board level. Right? They're important, you know, so which board members, which investors you choose is critical to kind of essentially kind of uh, being the kind of co-guidance in the company, all the way down to uh, the employees, the advisors, uh, the, early, the early people. The fourth rule is the plan for both good and bad luck. And, you know, people kind of don't usually first understand this point that I'm trying to make. Because they say, well, good luck. Well, good luck, it's all working. But what's, what's not to like? And the thing is, actually, part of planning for good luck is not that it just means it's forward motion from where you're at. But it also is, uh, essentially, sometimes you, 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 you come across something that you weren't expecting, and you pivot. And so good luck is finding an opportunity along the path. PayPal is a perfect example of this. You know, Tim referred to the PayPal Mafia. Well, the very <laughs> first idea at PayPal was encryption on mobile phones. Then it went to cash and mobile phones, then it went to cash and palm pilots, and cash and palm pilots syncing with email payments and a launch, and all of a sudden all these eBay people started using PayPal. Right? And the first week the company was like, oh, you know, why are these eBay people using us? This is terrible. And then about like day three or four, they're like, well, wait a minute, maybe these are really our customers. And all that was all fiction. Right? So that's part of what planning for good luck is. Planning for bad luck is a little conceptually simple, which is, you know, think about, okay, if this doesn't work, what are my lateral motion? Like, what else? It's not just, oh, I'll do something entirely different, but what are the parameters of, if I try this, that doesn't work, I'll try this. So, for example, when we launched LinkedIn, part of what I was told, good advice, was that LinkedIn was a terrible idea because in a network, there's no value to your first member or your second or your third. It's like, they all know each other. They have no value being in the system. So how are you going to scale to getting larger? Well, we figured, well, first we'll just launch with invitations. Maybe enough people will grok what it'll be when it'll be big, and it'll grow fast enough, and it'll get there all by itself. Well, <laughs> plan A didn't work. Plan B was, okay, maybe we can actually create an address book that people can use that makes inviting easier, and that got us to the curve where we got to millions of people. And then, then the network becomes valuable for everybody. The fifth rule is to maintain flexible persistence. And entrepreneurs get this weird advice. On one hand, it's, you know, keep a vision, be persistent, uh, struggle through adversity, right? Make it go, right? On the other hand, they say, well, be flexible, uh, change, uh, listen to data for what's going on, listen, uh, change to what your customer wants. And so, you know, it's kind of, well, if you look at it, <laughs> it's in conflict. And the reason why I call this the rule of flexible persistence is the art is knowing when to be persistent and when to be flexible and how to blend them. And it's one of the key skills in entrepreneurship. The sixth rule, and this one's been tweeted about a little bit, so this may be already known in the audience, is launch early enough that you're embarrassed by your one-off product release. <laughs> and the reason I use the word embarrassed is because we all have a natural tendency as product people to say, no, no, I want everyone to realize how great I am because they look at the thing when I pull back the covers and I say, look at this. And everyone goes, oh, you're a genius. <laughs> the problem is, is that you're, unless you're Steve Jobs, <laughs> you're most likely partially wrong <laughs> about what your theory was. And you're undervaluing the importance of time in the entrepreneurial endeavor, which is basically 
how to move ahead fast. So when we were launching LinkedIn, my four co-founders, Toby and Roman, said we can't launch yet. We have this feature, it's called Contact Finder. <laughs> you know, people want to understand how to use this. We can't launch until we launch this feature. And I said, well, let's launch. <laughs> let's see how it goes. And if, in fact, you know, that's the next feature to build, that's the next feature we'll build. We still haven't built the feature. It's nearly eight years, almost eight years longer <laughs> than when we first had that conversation. No, we still want to build the feature at some point. It just, it isn't the priority. And that the, the launching early is key for getting that engagement with customers. Like one of the ways you can characterize what is a first mover advantage is basically the person who gets to scale and is engaging with customers and getting the data of what, that, the, 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 uh, what your, your customers want from that product begins to adapt faster, and that's extremely helpful. The seventh rule is always keep your aspirations and aim high, but don't drink your own Kool-Aid. <laughs> Part of the thing about drinking your own Kool-Aid is where interpreters frequently go off the cliff is they go, no, I, I'm certain I was just right, this is the right thing. <laughs> the, the challenge with that is you have to both have that aspiration, have the vision for what the world, the way the world is different than it is now. But you also need to be constantly paranoid and checking yourself about, is this going to work? And there's a lot of different ways to do it. Some people say, well, get hypotheses, measure the data, you know, use a certain date and, 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 a, and a metric that you set in advance to whether or not you're on the right path. That's one. It works. It can work. Sometimes it's wrong. Sometimes it's right. But also, one of the things you can do is things like leverage your network or your friends. Leverage Leverage the fact of the smart people around you to constantly be giving you critical advice. Ask them always, what do they think is wrong? Because of course, one of the things your friends are is your friends are trying to be helpful. They usually don't tell you your child's ugly. <laughs> Whereas that's what you really want to hear, their perspective. Now sometimes they're wrong, that's fine, but you need to hear that in order to know. The eighth rule is having a great product is important, but a great idea for product distribution is more important. <laughs> because you can build a kick-ass product Something that is really, you know, like uses data the right way, gets to, you know, like this kind of just perfect thing. And if no one discovers it, if it doesn't get to millions of people, it's basically not relevant. <laughs> and so when you're thinking through your product invention, think through it in a way that includes the distribution, right? It's one of the things that I most often hear is people say, well, yeah, we'll add the social feature to it later. And it's like, no, that never works. <laughs> you have to build the social into the DNA. And that's part of thinking about the distribution. The ninth rule is pay attention to your culture and your hires from the very beginning, from your co-founders, because this essentially brings the, uh, you know, brings, they'll hire the next group of people, right? And that culture of how you adapt is really critical. And one of the things that is actually interesting about this accelerating world that we're living in, and online, is that it's now much more important to have people who adapt and learn quickly as kind of the people around you than it is decades of experience. And this is a little kind of entertaining because of course I'm 43 and I go, well, I have decades of experience. <laughs> but it's, it's your willingness to keep learning and to, and to apply yourself to thinking of each problem being potentially a new problem because the world is changing at this kind of revolutionary cycle every two to three years. And so getting that core of people around you is really critical. And the tenth rule is, these rules of entrepreneurship are not laws of nature. You can break them. <laughs> so it's a rule that says, don't listen to all the rules all the time. Part of what we're doing in entrepreneurship is we are doing something for the first time. And, and so when say, well, that's never worked before, it's like, well, maybe it'll work this time. Uh, you just have to pay attention to it because generally you're correct. So let's summarize and close. What we've covered is Web3 comes from the explicit, implicit, and analytic data that is being created from all of the different Web 2.0 apps, from online, from mobile, you know, sensors, uh, explicit in interaction, implicit, and that that is creating data in a lot of different sources. And I think one of the things that you'll see from this is that, you know, the, the, the five years from now, a, a product designer may have to have characteristics of essentially a data scientist. Talking about graphs, data normalization, these sort of things in order to get the products right. Because if this is right about, this is where kind of this big new vista of products are going to be coming, those are going to be the kind of skills that are essential. 
And yes, you can go look up all the data skills on LinkedIn and you'll find a skills graph. <laughs> some of these products will come from Web 2.0 companies. Some of them will come from entrepreneurs. So I thought it would be fun and slightly self-referential to close on the following suggestion. So, you know, we, what we said is, okay, it's networks, it's data, it's graphs. So if people tweet, right, you know, now, today, you know, soon, with your best idea and tweet it with the hashtag of pound web three, uh, south by southwest, we will create an info infographic, right, out of all these tweets. It's a kind of a real time experiment. It may work, it may not work, it may be interesting. But if you have ideas for what kinds of products should be coming out of the, the massive amount of Web 2.0 data that we have, we'll do that. And uh, we'll create the infographic, and then you know, if there's interesting stuff in there, we'll create a blog entry out of it as a way of kind of making this talk into a quasi Web 3.0 thing itself. And with that, I'm gonna open for questions. Uh, anything other than LinkedIn is fair game because we're in the quiet period and I can't answer any questions about LinkedIn. Thank you. Just a little, little question, Dave Smith from Media Smith. Uh, what, what do you want that hashtag really to be? Web3? Three, web3.0? Three uh, Web3, just a PBS. Web3. Three. Yep. W-E-B-3. Thanks. Yep. Hey there, uh, Philip from Zero. Um, wondering what your thoughts are on SIC codes and, and you know, people self defined I mean, they're horrible, uh, meaningless data set, really. <laughs> and um, so, how do you actually uh, kind of generate a data set that is meaningful and useful? Well, there's lots of ways to generate uh, meaningful data sets. Uh, I guess I've been given a lot of deep thought itself to SIC codes. Uh, I mean, one of the things that I think that we will do much more of is, as opposed to kind of like setting standards and doing top down, I think part of, given there's this massive explosion of data, you're gonna have, we have to do methodology that's much more bottom up. So for example, one of the things we did on LinkedIn is allow everyone to enter free text and then the data normalization. So the general approach to data design, I think should be more grass, more network up than top down. And that would be the approach that I look at. I know that's not terribly helpful, but that's, that's the kind of angle I haven't given it much thought. No, I will quote you, thank you. <laughs> hey, Dave from Newton. Um, what are your thoughts on people wanting to sort of control their own data, sort of the diaspora trend? So, uh, part of the challenge on creating data and controlling your own data is, is everybody kind of thinks about this problem as, well, it's the data I put in. You know, it's the, I turn on my phone, it creates data, I, I put something in a LinkedIn or Facebook and it creates my data. The actual interesting challenge isn't that data. That data, you know, you have commercial entities who have a relationship with you that want to preserve trust. You know, generally speaking, as long as it's a good commercial entity, you're, you're pretty good. The real challenge is not the data you create about yourself, it's the data that other people create about you. So think about this in terms of pictures. Like, my pictures that I upload and everything else, well, fine. <laughs> various ways. I take a picture of myself, I upload it, fine. It's the pictures that other people take of you, right? And in places you may not want them to be taking a picture of you, right? You know, it, the, the Friday night at, uh, you know, 2 a.m. at the South by Southwest party may not be your most flattering shot. <laughs> and so, uh, that's part of the reason why I generally think about this is not, like, how do we really fully control this? Because I think it's when you have millions and hundreds of millions of people all generating data, controlling data, <laughs> becomes an almost Sisyphean task. It's uh, how do you essentially craft it in ways that it's mostly positive and, and not that negative. So that, that's my general angle on these questions. And then it gets down to which data. This is the second rule of not all data creating equal. When it's like passwords or immediate location or those kind of things, you have to be much more careful about it because those can be much more damaging. Uh, but then the rest of it, you kind of kind of broadly steer it and the chips fall where they may. I don't know if that was your exact question, but that's how it goes. No, we read uh, Poppy Harlow with, with CNN Money. Um, I, I'm interested in this isn't data 3.0 oriented, but um, with your, you know, obviously with Ray Law, um, what do you think of valuations right now? You've seen these reports, uh, Twitter, you know, journals saying between 8 and 10 billion. Uh, Google has reported uh, bid for Groupon at 6 billion. Barry Diller telling us yesterday here that, that, that these valuations are mathematically insane, and I'm really interested in your take on, on that. Um, 
Well, one of the things that I've watched as a Facebook investor is that each round, it's like, oh, this is insane. Next round. Oh, this is insane. Okay, next round. Oh, this is insane. And really, when it comes down to mathematics and everything else, it comes down to what do you really think the growth rates and margin structure and everything else will be? And one of the things that's unique and interesting, I think, about the consumer internet is that you can have incredible growth structure and margin structure when you get right. And so it's not surprising that in those cases, the valuations really spike. And then you get some valuations spiking earlier because you kind of go, well, <laughs> um, if it could get to that, then it's really valuable now. And it's kind of hard to make that risk discount of how does it get to that. And some people don't make that risk discount very well, and so valuations can arise in a competitive bidding situation. Um, and so, it's not that I think that the, I don't know about the valuations now or exactly what they should be or should be comparably. But what I think is missed in the conversation is that high growth rates that can go to really, really high numbers fast with high margins is really valuable. Now, is this the exact number? Is this the exact number? Yeah, that's, you know, that's for analysts to talk about. So, a quick follow up a few years ago, Sean Parker did a, a great sort of breakdown saying basically Google won't win because networks are more important. Um, than just data or than content. So would, would your argument maintain that if, if they're really strong, it's in terms of the network that is the strength? I think networks are very strong, although I would say that Google also has networks. Right? AdWords is a network. There's a liquidity of uh, essentially uh, sellers and buyers that goes across it. There are actually implicit networks in what goes on in Google. That's the place I would say it's not the Google is not networks. Yeah. But networks are part of where a mass amount of scalable value happens. Absolutely. Thanks very much. It's uh, Matt from Next to Do. Um, from your talk, it sounds like Web3 winner um, is about a race, not just to scale, but to scale to get data. And then from there, to uh, I guess use it to do like social discovery and, and serendipity. Is, is that what you know, for, for example, like with GoMolo and the new release of Foursquare, I recommend your location to you based on where you check in, where your friends check in, and what you like. Would that be correct? Yes. As an, as an example. It, the whole thing to think about is what we're happening is everyone is generating tons of data. It's explicit what I create, implicit what is both data exhaust and also uh, things that I do that have corollaries and analytic, the site itself, uh, munging it, normalizing it, uh, putting it into a graph, using other data sources against it. That creates all kinds of different apps. One kind of app can be discovered, like what place should I go? Where should I go for dinner? Uh, how should I get there? You know, how should I drive? But there's other kinds of apps as well, right? And so. Uh, and matter of fact, one of the things I love about this game that we play with entrepreneurship is I'm quite certain that the amazing apps are not the ones I thought of already. I'm quite certain that in the broad network people will create them. So uh, that's kind of the, the arc. Harry, uh, my question is do you think that you can build uh, major business if you talk about being high? Can you build a major business on top of other APIs, or is it only the businesses that are the ones creating the APIs that can be the great big ones? Um, I think it's a little of both, uh, because remember this kind of sedimentary layers of stacks in terms of, kind of platform layers. So, uh, you know, PayPal was initially built on eBay, uh, YouTube was initially built on MySpace, and so the building, you know, Zynga is built on, on Facebook. Yeah. Um, and all of these, uh, you know, all of these can go and create their own ecosystem that can have a lot of gravity around them. So the fact that it starts there, doesn't mean that it necessarily ends there. It doesn't mean that it's not necessarily very, really big. It is, of course, great to be part of the foundational ecosystem. <laughs> now, you're the foundational one that a lot of the ones are built on. Those are, in fact, more valuable. But I think you have, you know, the general criteria for looking at big sustainable businesses are they kind of billion-dollar businesses. And I think you can build billion-dollar businesses on the on the platforms, some of the platforms that exist. Thank you. Hi, Rick. Chris Farrells of the Social Network. Uh, are you familiar with uh, Thelma Arnold? Uh, well, basically, uh, these New York Times reporters uh, created and, and traced her identity from anonymized data from AOL. Uh, how do we how do we uh, uh, protect ourselves from people mashing up all this implicit data that we're generating? Uh, I think the short answer is you have to presume that trying to make a data trail invisible for people is nearly a Sisyphean task, unfortunately. Uh, and that's part of the reason why I was doing the second law when I was thinking of the series about like kind of which data really matters, right? And when
when we create tons and tons of data, being able to reverse engineer it, like by touch, lots and lots of everything, reverse engineer to who I am, right. <laughs> it's much easier. And we create more and more data. It's not just the data I'm creating. That's part of the reason why it's a Sisyphean task. If other people take pictures, other people tweet and say, Reed Hoffman's here on stage at South by Southwest. I didn't create the data, it's still there. And so, uh, so I think that the real thing is how do we navigate it so that the, the really important things are controlled. You use some data, but you know, it's control right. And the rest of it, we kind of just try to steer it so it's mostly okay. And so I don't, I don't think we can eliminate it. Just like, for example, we, if we can limit all driving accidents, we'd love to, we just can't. <laughs> so we try to do as best we can. Thanks. Jeff Clay from Apple. Um, with all the data that people have been talking about that the whole world is generating, I can think of a lot of really nefarious uses and a lot of sort of fun and trivial uses and some useful ones like finding jobs and things. But I can't think of anything that's going to change the world in a way that's not just like, you know, embedding television changed the world, but it didn't cure all disease or stop global <laughs> warming or anything like that. Do you have hopes for things like that coming out of this data or is it just sort of vaguely useful? Well, so I usually characterize my investment theses as marketplaces, networks, or platforms. And part of the reason I think about those in terms of human ecosystems is the way that we make most human progress is how do we collaborate together. And so if we actually have a set of applications that affect how we create value and coordinate and collaborate, this is one of the reasons I found about in terms of work, right, in, in, in creating a whole, you know, in, in, in increasing liquidity and transparency around the labor force, talent, skills, <laughs> the people with my expertise in, all of that can result in the massive transformation. Right. And so it's not just, oh, it's a, you know, it's farm level. <laughs> there, there is also real work, how we really live. And, uh, and so I'm, I'm very bullish um, that, you know, networks, platforms, and marketplaces can create massive amount of value. Thank you. Hello, Reed. Sam for Dickert from. Good to see you again. <laughs> nice to see you. So it's interesting, two people ago, were t you were just talking about the issues of privacy and the Sisyphean task. The last couple of days, especially with, of all things, the Japan earthquake and such, seeing how government is having to deal with, for example, a nuclear reactor, I saw that on a show called West Wing. The very first season of West Wing, there was a discussion about a judge and the issue of privacy. What I'm wondering is that our country was founded on getting away from a pre-existing system to get away from taxation and so on. Do we have any hope that government can help us in this issue? Because you just described good companies will use the data for good purposes. And then you just talked about the idea of what reminded me of the Holocaust in terms of looking down the data and finding your friends. How can we create this ethic or the moral certitude in our government to help us? It's a great question and a difficult one and one that I will only say something brief to because it's like a whole topic unto itself. Uh, government most, uh, makes me more nervous than, than corporations which have a national incentive of keeping the customer relationship or dying. <laughs> right. Customer, governments make me more nervous, especially as I would mention in the talk, uh, if they're not well formed, <laughs> right? like e.g. they don't have the interest of the citizens or interest of people at heart and so forth. When I thought through this question, one of the things I realized that I actually really love to have as a citizen of the country is like a data dashboard that the government has about me. <laughs> right? Like I can go and say, hey, what information do you have? Because if it's something I need to like go and like you know change appeal, <laughs> or else I have an ability to do so. Like a credit score, like the credit scores that we have right now. Exactly, exactly. The credit score was the inspiration for like, what is the kind of the data dashboard, uh, and you know that sort of thing. I think is really important because in how the government treats the data about us, I think has a really has a much deeper impact that is not. So naturally aligned is actually a corporation who lives and dies, but whether or not their customers say, no, no, I'm sorry, we're done with you. Mm. <laughs> and so, because uh, for example, you know, it's relatively difficult to say I'm done with your government. <laughs> right? They don't allow that. Um, and so that that is I think the beginning of that, but I think the answer has to go much, much deeper. So I, I know I'm only giving a kind of a, a, a cursory gesture, but it's it's the beginning. Thanks. Uh, Aaron Sparling, uh, amongst other things, I teach uh, a series of technology classes to uh, designers at Cooper Union. And uh, one of the uh, problems we always wrestle with is uh, how to you know, deal with this monumental set of data for designers and developers to make interesting visual information about it. How do you see uh, education uh, institutions in general coping with uh, this growing kind of intersection of these two fields over time? That's another great question. Um, part of the challenge 
is that everything that's happening in these fields is an accelerated time clock, right? So, like, even to say, well, okay, read Tufty, and here's how you do data visualization, and everything else, that changes at such a fast rate. So I think that one of the things that needs to happen, and I think this is generally true of most education, especially as it ties to things in the workforce or things about being a modern citizen, is it needs to be much more adaptive to the times as they change so quickly. Right? Like, what is, like, what does a career path look like? <laughs> you know, what is a professional skill in X, Y, or Z, and, and how do you move between them? And data and design just being one of those. And so uh, I think that we need to figure out how to make adaptive networks so that the content, the teachers, the teaching is all moving at least at least a toe line behind the actual how reality is moving. I don't know if that's very helpful, but we'll also have to. Thank you. Hey, uh, Ron Lang, thank you for the talk, very interesting stuff. Um, one of the problems I see with creating networks is um, thickness of data, meaning there's not enough information statistically to be able to determine the results from that in a, in a quick enough fashion. One of the fears that I feel like, uh, here is as data becomes more and more transparent and more socially defined, it will there will be some backlashes as you, as you kind of mentioned in government regulation and things along those lines. So what are some of the techniques that LinkedIn has used in order to I suppose gain thickness from the data and what are some of these lessons that you've learned that one can apply as they're starting to build their own networks as well? Well in terms of adding semantic richness, uh, even when you have free text fields, you can do patterns analysis. You have a lot of different data, like in, for example, a network like LinkedIn on connections. Uh, the mashup with Wikipedia is another example. You have other data sources that can then uh, give another sidelight to this is extra, extremely important. And then there's also how you design your interaction model. Like when do you ask for different kinds of data? How do you, you can actually, as we begin to normalize the data, we begin to do type aheads. <laughs> right, in terms of how the data is coming in in order to scale it. Um, I don't know if any of those are the right answers would be helpful to you, but those are some of the ways that we've done. Yeah, thank you. Hi, my name is Natalia, and I'm Nakis Nakis on Twitter. In terms of right now with the unemployment crisis, a huge uh, issue has been that the, the more that someone is out of a job, the harder it actually is for them to be employed. And I'd love for you to talk a little bit about that skills ontology that you mentioned and the idea of a shift toward project roles and how being actually termed that way could actually help people get, you know, continue being employed versus being stuck with the unemployed um, so, term. So actually I'll answer that question in two parts. One part is, uh, one of the ways to navigate uh, this part of the whole trust network is actually the network of people around you and their ability to give you reputational data in terms of this person's hardworking, they learn fast, they're good, etc. is one thing that's helpful, plus introductions to possible jobs. So there's a whole network part of it. On the skills part of it, part of the, the thing we're building to, and we just launched skills you know, about two months ago, is to try to figure out like, okay, which skills are trending? What should I relate them to? What should I learn? <laughs> right? So like, what, like, oh, actually, like I live here in Austin. What are the skill sets that are on the growth in Austin? Right? That I should go learn those and which companies are those associated with and maybe those companies are growing and maybe my skills can be useful to them. And that's the kind of product that comes out of when you begin to actually study you know, the 90 million people and what's actually going on that you can begin to give pointers to individuals to how to navigate the world. It looks like that's the last question. Is there one more? Two more? Thank you. Uh, my name is Raghu. Uh, my question is more on talked about data and willing to share data. Uh, how do you relate that to copyrights and patents? Will corporations start patenting data as if they own it, even though they don't own it? <laughs> well, there's very complicated things because it's like the user creates the data, then it's uh, derived on a site, and then the site itself derives from information about it. So it all gets complicated. I think what will happen as a general phrase of art is that when these things are created through APIs or other kinds of access, including of course through loading one page, there will be certain kinds of rights that are like, okay, here's how, here's how you can mash up this data, here's what you can do with it. Um, and that's of course, like, once again, it's going to go from grassroots, you know, bottom and up, <laughs> right, as a way of making that work. And so uh, I think it'll be a jumble, but I think that's the pattern that we play out. I think one more question because I think we're almost out of time. Okay. My name is Guy Marion. Um, you mentioned you invest in marketplaces, networks, and uh, platforms. Can you give a sense of your relative size of each of those? How big can each of those industries be? How many primary platforms do you think that you 
sort of you know reach some sort of asymptote eventually, I guess? Well, I actually don't think of them in the industries. Uh, one of the investments I made last year was Airbnb because it's the marketplace of eBay for space. So marketplace, there's all kinds of different marketplaces. There's, there's Etsy, which is the marketplace for you know, handmade goods. There's all kinds of things. So each of these things themselves can be uh, essentially industry defining themselves. So the reason I think of them as categories, I think of them as kind of human ecosystems. And how do we have potentially hundreds of millions of people interacting and creating a valuable ecosystem both for individuals and overall? One last question. Sure, go ahead. Okay. So I think we all realize the value of data, but for certain industries, I think we found that uh, you can say education, maybe healthcare, um, that there's a chasm that uh, a lot of the people who, who are willing to provide, to make, to pay for this sort of stuff, uh, aren't willing to do it right now. So there's uh, entrepreneurs aren't incentivized to make these uh, applications because you know, uh, providers or insurance companies aren't willing to pay for it. How do you think we incentivize entrepreneurs to sort of cross that chasm and build these apps when there's not a real market for it today? Well, the short answer is if there's markets that we need to have, then we need to make sure that we're providing the right incentives. Uh, generally speaking, we trust the distributed marketplace when there's money actually already being spent that something could be provided that's much cheaper or something that's valuable. Do people want to pay for it? I'm not saying that's always the case by any means. It's not, you know, that's the ideal theory. Um, and so sometimes you actually have to do this through government incentives. I'm not saying that's the right one in this case, but you know that's that's the generic answer. You know, it, it kind of comes down to how do you craft the incentives for the specific problem you're trying to solve. All right, thank you. I think we're out of time. Let's get